The first question for, for all of you is, um, and I think we saw it reflected in the panel, but how does this issue play out in your area, your region? And particularly if you think that you know of a region that is either underserved or has something good going on, or do you think it is a very similar problem in all of Great Minnesota? And I will go Nancy, Tim, Jessica, and Amanda. Go ahead, Tim. <coughs> Hold it. Try this one. <laughs> so um, I think the problem is really the same, um, or basically the same um, across rural Minnesota, as well as um, rural parts of the whole United States. Um, one of the things that I wanted to just um, address was regulations. And um, one of the problems with less regulations are that, so in the infant um, care, there was um, some regulations, stricter regulations made a few years ago, and it's been saving lives. So there's been a drastic reduction of infant deaths in childcare because of those regulations. The other thing about regulations is we have to remember that there needs to be a balance. Um, I think we should look at, at our regulations. I think there are some things that um, maybe we could change. But at the same time, we have to remember that this is the most critical time of a person's life. Those child care providers are helping to build the brains of our next generation of citizens and workers. So we can't take it lightly. We can't, uh, I used to be a family child care provider. It, it's a huge responsibility. So I think there has to be some balance between what's best for children and what's doable. And I think we can come to those, um, to that balance. The other thing is that the higher the quality of childcare, um, we spend less money in special education when a child gets to school. Um, more children graduate if they're in high quality childcare. There's less um, children or people that are in the criminal justice system if they're in high quality child care. So I just, um, I just want you to think about um, how we can balance those two things that are so important. The, few, the lives of our children, the future of our society, as well as the regulations and how do we come together to um, do what's best for our children. Yeah. Well, I think uh, Marnie's report uh, did a good job of sort of summarizing this issue, especially the differences between rural and urban. Uh, it is a challenge in that um, in-home child care has been on the decline uh, for all the reasons that, that she cited. Uh, but in our region of South Central, Southeastern Minnesota, um, we still have somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 in-home child care providers. And so the bulk of the care and education that's going on for these preschool-aged children is occurring, occurring in that setting. Uh, the one thing that I will offer is that as we look for solutions in rural, um, different solutions for different communities. It may be in some cases that uh, this can be brought into the school. <coughs> the challenge there is that if you're only bringing the four-year-olds into the school, uh, then you're really disadvantaging um, the, the opportunity for the younger kids to find appropriate care in another setting because you're taking away um, one-fourth or one-fifth of the students uh, or the preschool age uh, kids that, that uh, need some kind of uh, care and attention. Um, but that can be a solution in some towns. Um, there can be community-based centers um, that are done in partnership between nonprofits, corporations, uh, local governments. Uh, there can be a business-based uh, solutions as there is in Harmony now. There were no child care providers in Harmony. It's in our corner of the state where our, our foundation does its work. Um, and there are licensed for uh, almost 100 slots. I think they've got 70 uh, enrolled there. Um, and, and so they, they met a, a community-wide need. Uh, but I'll tell you, I, it's not like they're making money on this deal. Uh, they put a lot of money into making that possible. They did it as a community benefit. Uh, uh, but they're, you know, they're not money ahead in a real sense. Um, so 
So I guess my sense is that as we go forward, a lot of this is going to still remain in the in-home setting. Uh, and that's why our foundation, which dedicates roughly $2 million annually to early childhood efforts, one way or another, we have 20 AmeriCorps personnel that we hire in place in early childhood sites to become essentially a teacher aide. We give away 50,000 early reader books to reading programs across the region to help get these kids ready for kindergarten. Um, but we also have something called the Quality Child Care Program, which we do in partnership with uh, First Children's Finance and Child Care Resource and Referral, which is now Families First. Uh, and we do two things with that program. We've taken hundreds of child care providers through this program over the last five years. Uh, it gives them business training because a lot of them um, need help understanding the business side of, of this enterprise that they, that they uh, this care setting that they provide. Uh, but it gives them the quality training, the parent aware educational quality training that helps them do a better job with these kids so that they leave their care ready to enter kindergarten. Because statistics do bear out, Nancy just mentioned some of this, you start out behind in that kindergarten classroom and you very often never catch up. Um, so we make an investment in this as a foundation in partnership with others because we believe it's a long-term better and quality workforce for our region. Uh, and, and that's why we think both the business training and the, for lack of a better phrase, academic training that we can provide to early childhood providers, particularly in-home providers, is going to be critically important in, in the, the months and, and years ahead. Um, and one thing dealing on the financial side is that if they get rated uh, on this parent-aware um, rating system, um, they will qualify for higher child care assistance payments for those kids that are, whose families are eligible for that, uh, and they will qualify for the state scholarships that are specific to low-income families in care centers that are quality rated. So that's an initiative that we've taken because we know that even though in-home child care has been declining in recent years, it's going to remain, at least in rural communities, a, a big part of how we provide the care that's needed for families in those towns. Hi, thank you. I'm kind of a last minute panelist, so I just got, I just had time to look at the questions now. Um, it plays out across the entire state. Um, we work with communities to kind of help them solve and think of creative solutions that are right for their communities. So. Um, child care is a huge issue, um, and people call us on a day-to-day, -day, um, constant, we have a child care shortage, we're thinking of building a center. And um, Marty's research actually is, is nice because it is what we hear and it's the information that we gather. So when we work with a community, we look at, okay, in your community, how many children are we really looking at that are not being served? Um, we do a gap analysis specifically on their community, on not only county level, but city level, because we know that county lines don't always match up with city zip code boundaries, and zip code and county boundaries don't always align with school district boundaries. And so we really look at lots of forms of data to get at how many kids under the age of five um, are not being utilized by childcare. And the reason that is important, because there's a lot of people say we have a crisis, um, communities kind of have a tendency to say, well, there's a crisis, let's build a center. And with First Children's Finance, we want whatever model that is developed to be a sustainable model and the right size for those communities. And like Tim said, not every solution is right for every community. So it's really integral to think about your community dynamics and try to find a solution that, that will fit your community. But we see it all over the state. All right, well, I'm just gonna be able to talk about my area. Um, I have owned our center since 2006. My husband and I are private owners. Um, 
We have, we're licensed for 95, and as Marnie mentioned, just because you're licensed for 95 doesn't mean you get to have 95 children. Um, we currently, we're serving 72 kids. Um, I have 14 people on staff. The reason I don't have more children enrolled is because I can't find staff. I can't pay them competitively to what the school districts are paying, um, and that's a huge issue. Uh, at my recent director's meeting that just happened on Monday, there were eight of us directors from our region um, in Southwest Minnesota that got together, and um, I asked them these questions because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just coming from me. Um, and like we've all received phone calls from families that want to relocate to our area um, with families. And they'll call and they'll say, uh, I'm moving this day, I need childcare starting, I have a one-year-old, a three-year-old, and a school-ager. And I'll say, okay, I can put you on the waiting list. And they said, what? I need, I need care, I'm moving. And they end up not moving to our community because there isn't child care. So economically, it's an issue. It's, it's affecting everything. Um, one of the directors shared a case that her sister is going to nursing school at Winona State. And they just received a letter in the mail that said the nursing program is being put on hold because the nursing professors and instructors cannot find child care. So, now another area that needs employees isn't getting the training to get there. So, um, that's where I guess my, my, my vision or what I see, that's where we see it. Great, thank you. And while you have that microphone, uh, Amanda, if, if, if you could, what do you see that, uh, you know, maybe bureaucrats, legislators, whether state or federal, what, what don't they understand about your business? And, and maybe if you could, what, what would you suggest changing? Um, sure, so um, things that they don't seem to understand, um, regulations is a big one. So um, I know Governor Dayton has talked a lot about the voluntary pre-K. I'm sorry I'm jumping ahead, but that's one of our questions. And, he keeps saying that if he takes out all the four-year-olds from daycare, it'll open up other spots. And that's not how it works. So if, if you take out all of my four-year-olds, you take out a quarter of my revenue for the year. I can't operate or I increase my charging by $50 a week to cover that cost. My families in Jackson cannot cannot afford that. Um, that's the first one. Regulations are crazy. Um, the second one is money. You know, there is a huge issue between what the center needs to stay afloat and what families can afford to pay. Um, because I'm a privately owned center um, and I do not have 25% of my population of my families that are low income, I do not qualify for the state food program. So that means the tuition that comes in pays for all of our meals. I have to pay property taxes. I have to pay all my city bills. I have, I have three people on staff that have teaching licenses. Um, the $15 an hour, they would be awesome. They would be like, oh my gosh, we have to thank you so much if I paid them $15 an hour. I can't afford it. I can't afford it. Um, so money, that's a big one. Um, I've talked with uh, people at the state saying, you know, you're, fun you're putting all this funding into school districts um, to let them use for pre-K funding. Um, if you look in Florida, if you look in Wisconsin, um, their volunteer or their pre-K is a mixed delivery system. So they attach the money to the child and not to the district. It makes more sense, and this is what we want for children in Minnesota, is for their parents to find the best fit for them. We want them to be able to have choices where their child goes. My program is different than the school program. I am a play-based program. They're more academic. Guess what? 
Not every kid in their program is going to be able to work in my program. Not every kid in my program is going to be able to work in theirs. And in in-home, they're different too. And it's awesome that parents have the choice. We want them to have the choice. But, you know, this whole, the pre-K thing, um, we talked about the decline in in-homes right now. Um, they take preschoolers out of the equation for an in-home. In-homes can have three children under the age of two. Think of this. Three children under the age of two. And the other nine have to be older than two. You take out four-year-olds that have pre free preschool at the school districts. What happens? They can't sustain themselves. They aren't going to stay open. They can't. You can't afford it. Um, sorry, I could just go on and <laughs> That's okay. Anyway, yeah, I think there, there has to be, you know, Minnesota's economy is, is centralized on child care and what there is available. It's essential to our economy, and the state does need to look at that. Finding qualified staff, that's another one. You can't find them. You can't find them. And once you get them trained, he said this about parent aware, you get them trained. I would have to spend thousands of dollars for my staff to go through training. Thousands. I'm not getting reimbursed for it. Thousands of dollars that I don't have for my staff to get parent aware rated. And once I get them trained, what happens? They go to the school district. Right? So I just spent thousands of dollars getting them trained, and guess what? In two years, I have to reapply for my rating, and whoever my new teacher is has to go through all of the training again. I only have one family that I could get a scholarship for, or the thousands of dollars worth the time, the energy, and having to turn around and do it all over again in two years? I don't know. And that's what I hear from a lot of people. I think rating systems are great. I think standards are amazing. They need to be. These are our children. But like, like Nancy said, there has to be a mix. There has to be a mix. You know, before you, everyone in the room is, is active in their city and their community. So, and what would advice would you have for city leaders? And this is a question for everybody. I said, well, we'll start, maybe start with Nancy, give you a break for a second, Amanda. <laughs> Catch your breath and drink water. But what advice do you have for a city manager, a mayor, a city councilor, a community development person that's, that's in the room here, that what could they do or what have you seen that, you know, they can't control St. Paul, they can't control Washington, what can they and what should they be doing locally? I think there um, is a lot that you can do locally. I think you can, um, so in our region, Region 4, um, each of our counties has an early childhood initiative, and I would recommend that you get involved with your early childhood initiative um, and work with those people to um, solve some of the issues. I think um, it's important to let our legislators know what we like and don't like. Um, I think it's important to look at, again, balance. Like, um, regulations aren't bad, but we need to work together to figure out how to make them better so that they work for the adults as well as the children. Volunt voluntary pre-K is not a bad thing. It's just the way we um, design it that can be a good thing. If we use voluntary pre-K and high quality childcare providers to provide voluntary pre-K, that's a good thing. That brings in more um, business for them. So I think we, there's nothing that's really simple about childcare. It's really difficult. And that's why I think it's important to have conversations with the people that are involved and um, work on solutions that, number one, make sure that our children are not only safe and healthy, but that they are developing. I think of childcare as a three-pronged economic driver. 
Child care contributes to building the brains of our next generation of citizens and workers. And I say that often because it's a really serious thing. Um, we have that opportunity when they're the, that little to make sure that they're going to be good citizens and good workers for, in our communities. Child care is a large industry in and of itself, so it doesn't just help other um, industries to be able to work because of parents being able to um, take their children to child care. But in and of itself, um, in 2012, the child care industry um, had revenues of $41.5 billion in the United States. So it's a huge industry. And then child care allows parents to be in the workforce, of course, and that's um, one of the reasons that um, we're talking about it a lot is because parents aren't able to do that. And so um, I think looking at child care in those three ways, that it's not just about getting parents um, able and out to work, but those other three things, um, or other two things. Um, a couple of things that um, West Central Initiative um, is doing is um, we have a, a, a grant for um, Moorhead, and we are helping Somali women become um, licensed family child care providers. We also have, uh, we give money to our child care resource referral to um, help recruit, recruit um, people into parent aware as well as into child care itself. We um, give our child care resource and referral um, funding for child care capacity grants. We um, ourselves do forgivable child care loans and we do um, family-based child care grants and then at um, West Central Initiative, we also have um, the child care center directors that meet monthly at our office. So the other suggestion I would have is contact your early childhood initiatives as well as your MIF, Minnesota Initiative Foundation, to see how you can partner with them. Uh, we um, have six rural uh, initiative foundations in Minnesota covering the 80 non-metro counties in the state. Uh, and we work collaboratively on a lot of issues. Um, I think, for lack of a better phrase, you could refer to us as community and economic development foundations. Uh, but all of us have some level of effort in the early childhood space. Nancy mentioned uh, twice the uh, early childhood initiative. Uh, across the state over the last decade, uh, all six initiative foundations within their region created uh, community asset-based planning processes around early childhood needs. Uh, and that has resulted in uh, addressing some of the quality and child care shortage issues in, in, in those communities. And we never really let go of those communities because as you said, you pull them back monthly for meetings. Uh, we pull them back quarterly for meetings. Uh, and so there's a leadership cohort in these communities that continues to work on this issue. Uh, so if you're in any community that has an early childhood initiative, that's one way to work through uh, an existing group to address uh, some of these concerns and challenges. Um, we add uh, one or two new communities to that network every year, so we're 23 communities that are early childhood communities in South Central, Southeastern Minnesota. Uh, but in addition to that, we have uh, several communities, Austin, uh, Fairmont, uh, three or four others, Faribault just last week, uh, that have pulled together a sort of community dialogue around early childhood needs. Uh, they've reached out, they, 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 they've got the school district, they've got early childhood providers, they've reached out to the business community because this is an economic development issue. It affects uh, all of their workers. Um, to create a dialogue about um, how to address these shortages and concerns within our community because as, as I think we've all said, starting with March, different solutions in different towns. Some make sense in this town, a different solution for a different town. Uh, but that's the way to begin the process, to just figure out uh, what's already there, what are the hurdles we have to overcome, what are some of the solutions that present themselves. Uh, and I, I think the, the organization to my right, as well as the regional child care resource and referral uh, groups, are the two organizations that you should pull in to provide uh, an, an overview of different options to consider uh, as you uh, pursue uh, new facilities in home, 
center-based, church-based, and school-based uh, that can resolve uh, your challenges in your town. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about who we are, because some of you might not even know who we are, that we even existed until today. Um, so we are a, a national nonprofit that focuses solely on the business side of child care. Um, we are, for a long time, we focused down in the Twin Cities Metro Center base um, and worked with them heavily. So you're responsible. <laughs> so in 2013, we partnered with the initiatives to really put together a pilot project called Greater Than a Men. Um, and we worked with communities to do a community engagement process to think of creative solutions to help offset this. Um, last year, we had our very first round of community applications, um, and we had 20 across the entire state where we were only able to select four because it's a very intensive process. Um, and so we kind of train a cohort of a core team to really understand what childcare is um, and the challenges that they face. Um, it's more than watching children all day. It's a highly regulated business that have very, very, very low profit margins. And when we talk about um, financial sustainability of programs, communities need to know that if they won't work, um, if there's not a partnership there. Um, family providers, after you look, I'm just going to get into a little bit of finances to uh, agree with what Amanda says. Um, family providers, when you look at their income and their true expenses of running a program, when we've analyzed family providers, 50% um, of them <coughs> are making less than $8 an hour. And they're working 10 hours, 12 hours a day, five days a week. Um, when you look at centers, finding that teacher qualified staff is a huge struggle and being able to pay them is even harder. Um, out in rural Minnesota, um, center staff is between nine and $13 an hour, not close to that $15 mark. So we look at those uphill struggles and how to make them work. Um, and then uh, I had another thought, but I kind of got sidetracked on the finances. But um, when we educate community members and they understand the challenges, they start creating and understanding what those partnerships may look like and how that might be supplemented by the community um, and how they could grow and looking at the right size and the best fit option well, for them. Okay. Hang on that mic for one second because I think if people didn't know about you before today, they're, they're going to want to know about you. Like, there are communities in this room that are going to reach out to you and we'll make that information available. Uh, the, the data that you sent us, I assume yeah. we can share that? Yes. All right, great, because they've got a wonderful report that talks a lot about this, and we'll get, we'll get that link out to everybody. But I want to ask you one particular question about that, and I, I thought it was, was fascinating, because in greater Minnesota, you know, the former legislator guys here, well, you know, you guys have a, a cost of doing business advantage. It's just so much cheaper to do business out there that you just don't need as much money as people in much poverty. You should be able to do much more for quite a bit less. Uh, you had a slide that I thought was interesting, and maybe maybe talk about that. The one that, that looks at the revenue and the income in in, in, in metro areas, uh, how much more they have, and then how much less or more their costs are. How those balance out? Sure, I actually brought it with me so I don't mis um, speak. But um, programs in the seven county metro make uh, nine thousand dollars more annually in profits than Greater Minnesota. Um, yet, the difference in program expenses is about $1,200. <coughs> and, yeah. $7,800 behind, you know, and I think for a lot of metropolitan people, and it's, it's not that they're out to get us, I think they just, that's a thumbnail, gee, it must be cheaper to do business out there. I hear that a lot of housing and other places, that's just, if it ever was as true or as, as much of an advantage as people think, it sure isn't anymore. You know, City of Jackson, I know, is here. What, what, what would you recommend? What would you say that? Uh, 
here's what I'd recommend to you is reach out to the providers in your in your counties and your cities. Um, recognize them for the work that they do because most likely they don't get the recognition from parents. Um, we're not babysitters. We are not babysitters. It is within our regulations that we have to have curriculum. We have to be doing basically every, we have curriculum for infants, right? I just had a parent say to me, why do you have to have a teacher in the baby room? And I said, do you want somebody in the baby room that knows how your baby's supposed to develop? The answer is yes, you do, right? So invite them to come in, sit down, talk to them. I will tell you there's an, there's an underground network of child care providers. <laughs> they all talk to each other. They all know what's happening in each other's programs. They all know, you know, <laughs> those families. <laughs> Be kind to them. Just love on them a little bit, but talk to them. Because those are the people that are going to be able to answer your questions. Those are also going to be the people that are going to understand where you're at in your town. Um, I know right now, I have about 40 kids on my waiting list. I could double my center. I take 12 infants. I have 16 infants on my waiting list. Where are those parents going to go? And I was just told that Lakefield, right next to us, like eight miles. Our, our area that we provide is uh, care to is about 45 minutes all the way around us. Um, but Lakefield's like, what, nine miles away? Um, they're losing two in-home providers at the end of this school year. Where are they going to go? I don't know. So talk to them. Invite them in. Make them feel special and valued, and they will give you amazing feedback. Next question, and I'm going to combine two, two into one, but as, as the Partnership and Coalition has been seeking uh, input, there's a couple things that, that jump out or, or have jumped out to me uh, that in general people do not see uh, particularly in home providers as business people. And how do we change that? How do we how do we get people to think about this both as a opportunity to own your own business and the flip side? How do we change the uh, perception that people have in communities that this isn't this isn't benevolence? I mean, they're good things and working with kids for you know, people might love that, but it's a business and it, it's got they got to make the bottom line. It's got to be profitable. It's, you know they, they don't uh, travel separately. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Is, that? is that an accurate perception and how do we change it? Um, child care programs are absolute businesses. They spend money, they pay taxes, um, they employ people. They are their own business entity. And yes, they are not viewed in the general community as businesses. Um, and them, themselves don't necessarily have the business training to run their businesses as an effective businesses. So when we work with child care providers, we do um, business trainings to help um, understand that their business is a viable business and how to run it better <coughs> so it's um, more sustainable and longer lasting. The biggest complaint we have from providers is people don't take us seriously they treat us like babysitters, and half the time they pay their babysitters better than they do their child care provider. Um, and they feel like parents just know what they're writing at the end of the week, or the, and they multiply that, and they're like, well, this provider's making a bunch of money. But when you look at the finances and the actual costs of running the business, they're not. And um, some of it's that just that general understanding of of their business and what they can and cannot do and how the regulations and the ratios change um, and how they can maximize those ratios. So when they talk about universal pre-K, you understand how that could negatively impact the local businesses. If they're not open um, 
you won't have employees being able to work for you. And you hear that from community to community that um, they've offered jobs or parents had to leave the workforce um, because there isn't available childcare. Um, nationally, businesses lose about $3 billion a year on childcare related issues. Most of the families either have to be tardy because they of child care. A lot of families have to drive 30 minutes out of the way to find child care, um, which makes them somewhat sometimes late. Um, parents not or having to take sick days or absent from work um, is really high. Not being able to take different shifts or even not taking career advancements because of child care related issues. Um, we work with communities all over the state and the four that we are working with now, we've done um, parent surveys to really see how it's affecting the businesses. And, um, and when you have over 50% of the respondents from those businesses saying, yes, I'm tardy for work because of childcare. Yes, I am uh, missing work because of childcare. You need those businesses in your community for your businesses as well. And Tim, I know you know the, the foundation has done some work in that area, and that's one thing I think will answer the question for you. Yeah. You feel kind of passionate about how do we do that? What do we do to change yeah. that perception? Well, and your, your comment about uh, these being businesses really resonates because whether it's a for-profit, non-profit, a church-based, a school-based, center-based, they all have. There's a budget. They all have to. They all have to make ends meet. So they are a business, and um, I think increasingly uh, the providers are, are viewing themselves as business people in that sense. Um, but they also uh, are increasingly understanding that they are preschool educators, and uh, that's why uh, several years ago we worked with. First Children's Finance and Families First, which is formerly Child Care Resource and Referral, uh, to develop curriculum on the personal side and develop curriculum on more the academic side uh, so that we could, throughout our region, offer training programs for early childhood providers from all those settings uh, in both of those regards, business and, and academic. Um, and we've taken several hundred providers through that program in the last five years. Uh, we've secured funding from private sources, other foundations that are willing to give us a grant to expand the program to two or three or four counties uh, each year. Uh, and it is our intent to continue uh, raising dollars to, to fund this training program uh, uh, going forwards because the need will not end. It's, you know, we've always got people leaving uh, the sector and you need new people coming in. Um, and we also provide continuing education credits for folks that come to these trainings. Uh, there's no cost to these trainings. Uh, they are evenings and Saturdays because what did you have to do to get here today? Juggle a lot of things. Uh, and so it's really a very user-friendly approach. We'd like to be able to, and, and we did this statewide with the other initiatives with some money that was available for a short period of time. Uh, but, but frankly, and not, not to put in too heavy a pitch, we've, we've got a couple rural legislators that have introduced a bill to give each of the initiative foundations dollars so that we can continue this partnership with these two organizations to do more of these trainings all across rural Minnesota. And if anyone's interested in learning more about this particular program, the Quality Child Care Program, uh, or the legislation that um, Carla Nelson and Bob Gunther have introduced. I've got extra copies of that with me. That sounds good. Nancy, same question, but I also want to add a little, a little, a little wrinkle. Uh, well, I would hear the same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, but I'll answer a couple of points in the room. Rachel, yeah. <laughs> uh, part, part of this is 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 clearly uh, this is an industry that's dominated primarily by women. Yep. Right. What impact does that have? Do you think it would be different? I mean, is it is is, is at, at whether it's overt or not? But how how much of, of this uh, getting more money into this is simply uh, sexism or or not? <laughs> Go for you. 
Well, um, I think that um, we have thought throughout history that um, caring for children, educating children, is a women's issue. It is not, but I think that that does um, have an effect on the willingness, willingness of us as a society to pay um, child care providers not even a living wage. And so I think of all the people here in this room and other people that I work with, how many of us would want to um, help build brains for $10 or $8 an hour? Five days a week, 12, 14 hour days, not many of us. I, I did it for over 10 years and um, I got a little burnt out. Um, I think one of the um, other things that we didn't discuss today is that um, one of the reasons for um, us losing childcare providers is just like any other industry, is the aging out of people. This isn't a, um, a business that you can do. Um, well, some people do, but a lot of people do not do it into their 70s because it's really hard work. So I think we have to look at that to the aging out. And younger women are less likely. When I started um, childcare, you know, I was okay with um, earning less money. I, um, I loved kids and so I'll, I can do this. But um, I, I think today's young women are less likely to see that as an okay thing, which it really isn't. Just because I love children doesn't mean I should be able to do it for five, ten dollars an hour. Um, when I started um, as a child care center teacher, I made four dollars and fifty cents an hour. Crazy. I was helping build the brains of our next generation of citizens. Um, one of the things I think um, also that we have to remember is that whether there's um, less regulations or not, if women do not make more money, they're not going to go into this business or they're going to get out of it as soon as their children are in grade school. So we have, um, we can open, we can, um, you know, do fundraising and open up a child care center, the building part of it, and the industrial kitchen and all of, all of those things. But if we can't find the women to do the work, and I say women because I think it's 98 or 99 percent women who do the work, um, if we cannot find women to do that work, we're always going to be sitting in a room like this, trying to figure out how we can um, solve this child care shortage. And so we really have to think about what is our societal responsibility to children, to families, and to employers. So I think we have to think of that. And the other thing um, about childcare is not only do we not make very much money, we don't have um, high status. You know, there's this, this status hierarchy and childcare is really kind of at the bottom of the educational hierarchy. And so, um, it's also difficult, when I did family child care, I often had people, I felt like they were taking advantage of me because, well, you're at home anyway and you're just, you know, watching children. So the status isn't there either. And that's important to people. And if you want to uh, make a career out of it, you want to make money, but you also want to feel like people think you're doing something really important, which you are. And I think I answered your question. I answered so too. I mean. <laughs> Um, one thing I would just add, um, and this is kind of going back to state and federal, would be uh, benefits. Um, child care providers do not have a health care benefit, and that's what I constantly hear from my employees, is, you know what, Amanda, it's getting really tough, and, you know, my husband's job doesn't have health insurance, and if we can't find it and be able to afford it, I'm going to have to quit and find a job that has health insurance. So, you know, is there something that they can do with a health care pool or um, something to that effect? It would be something um, to definitely think of and consider. Great. Why don't we uh, take a couple questions from the audience and let's start with a holdover question that uh, Eric Anderson from Mankato asked earlier, and it's the union question. And, and it, did it have an impact or didn't it? And, and maybe also, 
how much of that do you think is at play in the early uh, childhood discussion? It was kind of interesting that someone acted in this field, quote, you know, warned me, you know, hey, be very careful because you're gonna step on toes. And it's like, well, why don't we just see what the right thing to do is first before we worry about, you know, what type of employee it is. And so it's out there, we may as well, sort of likely, is this a women's issue or not? We may as well talk about it. Uh, so, so his question was, how much did the uh, attempt to unionize a couple years back, how much is, is, is that impacting this, and how do you see this uh, helping or not helping or hurting as individual as far as uh, if you do go to the uh, mandatory uh, pre -K. I think the union um, issue did um, have an impact, um, but I think it is less of an issue now. I think it's kind of one that um, people kind of like, we're not going to have a union, so I think that one is kind of in the past maybe, and I might be wrong, that's just my opinion. I just have not heard anyone talk about the union issue. Um, I think there were maybe people, so the union issue and then um, stricter regulations came about, kind of at the same time. So it's a little hard to figure out which was the biggest issue, but I think it was regulations. Um, and so I, I think that the union issue is probably a big thing. And again, voluntary pre-K, it doesn't matter what um, the building is that it takes place in. Um, high quality family child care providers. So I used to be a family child care provider and I um, used to work for ECFB and school readiness. I did the same thing in my home as I did in school. I think I did the same quality in my home as I did in school. It shouldn't matter the building you're in. It really matters about the staff and their um, quality. And so I think voluntary pre-K in our state, as it is in others, um, should be a mixed delivery system where family child care providers, centers, uh, Head Start, we should all be able to do voluntary pre-K. It should not have to be only the school in the school building. And that is where you can, uh, I think, make a difference. Talk to your legislators of, about um, that. You know, rather than, unless, unless someone has something different to add so we don't end up, you know, me too, me too, me too, uh, let's go see if there's other questions that, that might be more beneficial. In the back, please. Well, I, I've got a question. In Detroit Lakes, our median family income is 37500 and mom and dad both working. So I know what the infant care is in town is very expensive. Now, Amanda, what, what is your billing rate for children that are two, three, four years old? What do you, what do you charge per hour or by week for those people? So in our center, we have a flat week rate. So all of my families are full-time families, um, and it depends on the number of hours that they're there. So if they are there up to 46 hours a week, um, they pay $154 a week all across the board. And if they're there over 46 hours, it's $160 a week. My school agers, um, during the school year, it's $50 flat for the week. They come before and after school. And for non-school days, it's $2.95 an hour. Way in the back. Thanks. I got a couple of comments because I was one of those men that tried to be child care. I ran the center for six and a half years. I tried to hire young individuals, but the negative stigma attached to it is the first question is asked is what you why. Yeah. So until that changes, a lot of the kids that I had in my center did not have any positive male role male models, except for the eight to ten hours they were in our center where they could see men being caring, men serving, men being out in the community. So that's a really huge issue that, that, that needs to be addressed overall. Um, and the other thing I, I wanted to point out is that it's great that they're providing free trainings in the evenings and on Saturdays, but where are those staff sending their children for child care? In the week, evenings and weekends. And we have to pay and them. Still, we, were, we were still paying them. We have to pay school. them to go to those trainings. So they work eight hours, maybe, maybe they started at 5 a.m. because that's when we were in. And they work their eight hours, they go home for a nap, they drive an hour for training, they're in training for three hours, and they get to do it all again tomorrow. So this, the, the health is good. It was good. I've been out for about two and a half years, but I still keep a real close eye on the center. Um, if we were a nonprofit center started by two nonprofit organizations. Uh, we were licensed for 122 children. 
And um, there's a big difference. I, I appreciate your, your learning are a little too, I mean, but nobody would pay anything more. Did you hear that? No. <laughs> I have one of my moms here. <laughs> They're glory, but, but what ends up happening is you have to find the balance between those families that you do three days a week and the ones that you do all the time. So we had, we had enrolled in our center, we had 150 people enrolled, but we're serving 75 a day with our license capacity of 122. So it's a delicate balance of, of staffing. It's, it's a huge thing for one person to manage. So I applaud you, and, and you deserve you deserve all the love you can get from this group, by all means. Great. Next question. You, uh, you, uh, you sir. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, so you talked about uh, the things that our local elected officials can do in terms of connecting and solving problems within their community, uh, connecting with their providers, connecting with the other institutions uh, at the county level. So what can we as a statewide organization, uh, an organization with a reach in just about every corner of the state, do to help on this issue um, is it a matter of trying to sort of focus on specific public policy solutions? Is it a matter of uh, ringing the bell and shouting from the rooftops at our policymakers that this is a problem that they need to pay attention to? Uh, is it a matter of, you know, one of the things that occurs to me is there are a lot of great local solutions at local levels and there's a lot of people working locally on these things. Is it a matter of trying to find a way to share that knowledge and that experience uh, across the state um, with folks, you know, beyond their region. So what, what should the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities be looking at in terms of a, our role as a statewide organization? All of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, um, it, it be, because this has to be solved in different ways in different communities, yeah. uh, if the state is going to get involved, uh, the, the approach that the state takes through legislation or appropriation ought to be sensitive to that instead of trying to impose a one-size you know, solution to all of this. Uh, so that would be the first thing I would say. It would be helpful if your organization, especially since it's supported by lawyers, um, could look into this regulatory side just to see you know, if there's anything there that could ease the burden and the expense without sacrificing quality and safety, um, because that's, that's an across-the-board issue for any type of setting. Uh, so those are two things that, uh, that I think uh, you could specifically focus on. One thing I was told about by somebody in our um, Child Care Aware Office, which is formerly Child Care Resource and Referral, so they call it Child Care Aware um, in my region, um, she told me that there is language in the pre-K um, legislation about mixed delivery, but it comes with all these little things attached to it, like um, my teachers in my center, because we are licensed teachers, would have to answer to the superintendent. So they would no longer be under me, they would be under the school district. So, and there, I don't believe there's anything in there on in-home. I don't, I haven't read it. There is, okay, yay. But I would say look at the language that's in there to allow for a little bit broader. Nancy, Nancy. Uh, my suggestion would, um, Definitely make sure that you involve the people in the field in the discussions um, because they are the people who are on the ground doing the work. And then the other thing I would do is um, not look for um, an absolute solution. Um, that doesn't have to be an either or thing um, on regulations or voluntary pre-K. There's almost always a way to do both. Um, and I think sometimes we think of things as it has to be this, or it has to be that. And I think there's um, ways that we can think creatively so that we can come up with solutions that are both of those things. Great. Uh, other question? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, I wonder if you might address, uh, and, and just to make the comment, you know, one more stop before going to work and, and the proximities of 
for business and, and uh, home and daycare. But I guess I'm, I'm curious, and in, in my community we have a large employer, 3,300 employees, and uh, planning and expansion with another 1,000 employees. Uh, I respect the fact that they're concentrating on their business, but how do you engage? It, it, it just seems to me, standing on the sideline, some partnership, if it's an economic development issue and it's about having uh, people, isn't there a proximity that we could take advantage of? And how do you address, obviously not a smaller employer, but a larger employer to say, uh, let's start a partnership to see if we can do something with your workforce and, and help build a, a better capacity for your employees to get child care. Yes, it <laughs> So um, businesses care about their bottom line and they care about their employees getting to work and being at work and finding a workforce when they need to have a workforce. And I would say it's um, large employers are starting to get the picture that this is not just a parent issue, this is my workforce issue, because they've had firsthand um, people not take jobs or leave the field um, due to childcare issues. And so as long, once it starts really impacting them, um, they become a player at the table and try to figure out ways that they can participate um, this if it's sponsoring a room at a child care center, if it's uh, purchasing slots from a couple family providers, if it's building something on site. Um, there was a business that um, has a child care program as a benefit package where um, the business owns the child care program. It's a family license, so the rules and regulations fall under the family rules and guidelines versus the center rules and guidelines. Um, their HR director has all the required trainings, so if the provider that they hired that now gets paid for what she was doing, um, she now gets benefits where she didn't have benefits before. If she's sick, the HR director goes right in and um, fills that role so that program doesn't have to close and those families um, are um, are still available to go to work. They also pay for half of the tuition expense and they really view it as a recruitment and retention tool where they were able to recruit and retain um, a very high qualified person that um, to be in, an employee because of this benefit package. And they had a family of four um, where the mom had to stay at home because they had four kids. He was on the road as a truck driver. And so when this company had this, he decided to become an employee of this company. And now his wife is back in the workforce as well because now they can afford childcare. So yeah. when you start to think about businesses, um, you really have to set the link of how it really is affecting them. Um, it's not just affecting the, the parents, and it's not just the parents. Um, so we have done surveys with particular businesses that it's not only a national statistic on how many employees are being tardy or how many employees are struggling because of child care issues. Um, they have actual data on their end that can make an educated decision and say, yeah, this is a negative impact on my business because of child care. Great. We take one more question in the back. Vincent, uh, in many of our small communities cycle through small city grants through D. In our case, in Vincent, we're going to do 20 homes. So it'll be roofs, siding, windows, <coughs> etc. We have asked D on the last three rounds in the last 12 years. If we could use those dollars for home daycare to do egress windows, uh, kitchen improvements, bathroom improvements, carpeting, uh, health and safety issues, the answer is consistently no. But there's no reason you can't because those are the kinds of improvements the grant does, but they don't want to connect it to a home business. And in answering your question, what can the coalition do, please? Next time you talk to me, bring that up and see if they can't change that rule of the small city grant program. 
Um, I just wanted to say a, a little thing about DEED. We've been um, talking with DEED. We um, had a meeting with the um, commissioner of DEED. And I think um, DEED has a lot of learning to do about child care. Um, I don't think it's been on their radar um, for a long time. And so I think um, you're exactly right that we need to be talking to people at DEED and informing them about how child care fits into what they're doing. And I think they're starting to get that, but um, I, I just think we need to do um, a lot of educating with DEED and, and other agencies also. And then I just wanted to say one more thing about um, the business of child care. Um, it is a business, but it's a really special business, and I call it the brain building business. Um, and I, I just think that we cannot um, dwell on that too much. I mean, we, we can't, we have to dwell on that a lot because it is a business, but it's about building brains, it's about children, it's about um, building our next generation of citizens. So I think it's just a, a special, special business. And I just want to tag on because I, I believe West Central and Southwest initiatives both got these dollars, and I believe both have used them in a forgivable loan program to help early childhood providers. So at least uh, those deed dollars have been made available for this purpose. Uh, and in our case, uh, with other dollars, our own dollars, we have a what we call a building blocks loan program. It's not uh, forgivable loans, but, but uh, very low interest uh, loans and uh, repayment schedules that are very, um, I don't know, friendly to, to the borrower that we use for uh, early childhood needs just as the ones that, that you described.